Hey, Julie, what's happening? Hi, Dwight. What's up? You, uh, you okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Are you, are you sure you're all right? Mm, I, I just don't know how to talk about it. Would you be up to playing a game of trying to figure out what that emotion is? We're gonna put a name to that emotion. A game. Just a little game. <laughs> you up for it? Okay, Dwight, let's play a game. All right, let's try to name that emotion. Hi, everybody, Big Carbondale. Welcome to another edition of Name That Emotion. We have an action-packed show for you tonight, but let's meet our contestant, Julie. Welcome, Julie. Hi, hey, hi, uh, um, yeah, that'll work. All right, so hey, Julie, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, Bink, I'm from Pittsburgh, and I'm a Steelers That's fan. That's enough and... about that. How about we start playing Name <laughs> That <laughs> Emotion? <laughs> All right. All right, Julie, first word, let's get your mind engaged here. Let me ask you a question. I'm the world's fastest animal. A cheetah. Ah, good job. Yes, that is correct. All right, try. Let's do a finish this popular tune. I'm going to sing the beginning of a tune, and you're going to finish it. Ready? It's a beautiful day, day in, in the, the neighborhood. Oh, wow, you are on it today. Correct. All right, next question. This is a sports one. Let's see. You said you're a Steelers fan. Let's see if you know this one. Next question. Art Monk, John Riggins, and Joe Theismann are former players of what team? The Washington Redskins. Technically correct, but we still have to penalize you for saying the name. Tough break. Next question, though. How would you describe our current state? It's like a rectangle, and it has um, mountains and Not farmland. Not Pennsylvania, and... our state of a Fairs. Oh, like Franklin County Fair and Mount Alto Volunteer Fires. Affairs. Uh, Actually, for, for, forget that. How are we all feeling things are going right now? I would say great. I've only missed one question, so I think I'm going to get that big prize. <laughs> Not on this show, but in general, Julie. We were actually looking for unpredictable and frustrating according to nationwide oh, polls. Oh, okay, well, that's true. So what do you feel like you can do about any of this, Julie? Nothing. What can I do? Better just not to even try. So you feel disheartened? Yeah. Demoralized? Yeah. And what's the word that wraps it all together? Discouraged. Yes, I feel discouraged. Yes, Julie, you have done it. That's what you were feeling all along. You have made that emotion. Man, that was a lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, now you have a name for what's going on inside. Thanks, Dwight. That was very helpful. Now what do I do with it? Now that I know what this name is, that I'm, that, how I'm feeling. That is a great question. Well, you're in luck because Pastor Mike today is going to talk about in service what to do with our discouragement. All right, we're about to get started. Let's head on in. All right, let's sing this together. I was buried. Here we go. I was buried beneath my shame. And who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing. I was breathing, but not alive. And all my failures I tried to hide. It was my dream. Till I met you. Call my name. You call my name. Yeah. 
Thank you, Jesus. I needed rescue. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you crawled me a citizen of heaven. When I was broke.
Great job, guys. Thank you for helping us to worship today. Thanks so much for joining us online again this week. Uh, we're really glad that you've taken the time to, to watch and worship with us today. Um, you know, I just want to encourage you at some point uh, while you're watching or after the, you watch the service today, take a moment. Just let us know where you're watching from. Uh, you can fill out one of the attendance and uh, welcome cards. There's some links on our online platform and places on YouTube uh, as well as our Facebook page. So just encourage you to take a moment. Let us know where you're watching from. And if you have a prayer request, make sure you include that on that attendance and prayer card, and we'll pass that on to our prayer team, and they'll be able to pray for you and this week uh, that is ahead. Also, just thank you uh, for your continued giving. Uh, we have uh, ways for you to give online uh, on our app and on our website, and uh, I just encourage you to, to continue to be faithful in your giving to our church. It really helps us to continue to, to uh, get the word out about Jesus in our community and really in our nation and, and all over the world as well. Just a reminder that we have this new time schedule that we're doing now, and, and uh, you know, 9.15 and 11 and 4 and 6, when we're watching online, uh, that's our schedule for these weeks and probably another month or so at least uh, here at our church. So, uh, you know, we just encourage you to keep joining us online. I also would just invite those of you watching online, if you're local, uh, to join us out for our service out at the park. It's Sunday mornings, 9.15. Service lasts about an hour. Uh, feel free, you know, to dress casually when you come. Uh, if you want to bring a canopy to help give you some shade, you're welcome to do that. Uh, we have a children's program and a youth program right after the service. So, uh, you know, right around that 10, 20 time frame, we have something special for our kids and for our youth, and, and we would welcome them to come and be a part of that as well. That lasts about 45 minutes. And so we, uh, we would just love to have you come out there. You can social distance plenty, you know, face masks, that's totally up to you because we're outdoors. But great way for you to, to worship with some others in person, and we would welcome you to come join us in the park in these weeks that are ahead. If it rains, then it's all online uh, for those weeks where the weather doesn't uh, cooperate with us. Um, next Sunday evening, we're going to have a pool party. We've done this for years, and uh, we really kind of wondered, you know, is it, we were going to be able to pull this off this year or not because of all the guidelines and restrictions. So as of today, uh, we're still planning to do it. So it's next Sunday at Northside Pool in Waynesboro from 7 to 9.30. Now, we have some limitations. We can only have uh, 450 people come. That's a restriction of the, the size of the pool right now because of the guidelines. So if we were to have more than 450 people, then we'd have to, you know, stop. But, but uh, we would welcome you to invite some friends, come and, and join us. Uh, so Sunday evening, uh, next Sunday evening, 7 to 9.30 over at Northside park. Well, when we first uh, had to make this decision about going online and stopping on-site services, it was in the middle of March, and we were looking forward to Palm Sunday, and we had a whole group of children and students in our church that were looking forward to that day as a part of our dance ministry. It was the day they were going to share with us their worship through the expression of dance. 
And, uh, you know, that didn't all play itself out that way. And so our older kids in our dance ministry, you know, they had, they had rehearsed and, and, and practiced this song uh, with a dance with the song Living Hope. And uh, we kept saying to them, yeah, at some point here, we hope to be able to have you to share that. But things kept getting delayed and delayed. And two of the students in that ministry are seniors this year, and they're headed off to college soon. And we wanted to give them an opportunity to be able to share that dance with you today. And I think you will be blessed by it. It allows them to express their worship to God through dance, and it will help us to worship God as well. So we hope that you'll find this meaningful as they share it with us today. Sealed the promise, your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave as no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of
Well, that was awesome, wasn't it? Uh, I'm so proud of our dance ministry, and, and I'm so glad that they were able to, uh, to share that with us today. Well, for the past three weeks at our church, uh, we've been spending some time talking about how, how do we move beyond some of the issues and some of the feelings that many of us are experiencing right now because of all the challenges that are going on all around us. And uh, we've been talking about, so how do you move beyond feeling the way that we're feeling and dealing with some of these challenges? Uh, when we first started, we took a week and we talked about, you know, how do you move beyond feelings of fear and worry and anxiety? Uh, two weeks ago, we spent a little time talking about, so what is God's perspective about injustice? How do we move beyond injustice? What, what is a biblical response to all of that? Uh, last week, we talked about how do you move beyond uh, feelings and emotions of anger. Uh, you know, I, I know a lot of people are really feeling some frustration and anger because of the guidelines and the restrictions and everything that are a part of that. You know, it's been interesting over these past three weeks, I've had a lot of people communicate with me just how meaningful this series has been, how well it's connected with them. And I, I would just tell you, you know, uh, as I work on messages and prepare, um, you know, one of the things that God does is speak to my heart. And, and these issues we've been talking about are issues that, that I needed to think through and study and, and, and work through some in my own life, and especially that issue of anger last week. Today, we're going to talk about another issue that I know a lot of people are experiencing. In fact, I would just say to you, you know, anger is probably one of those things that I struggle with the most, but this is a close second for me. And it's the issue of discouragement. How do we move beyond feelings of discouragement that so many of us are experiencing right now? It's easy right now to feel discouraged. It's easy right now to even lose some hope because it's hard for us to be able to see how this thing's going to end that we're experiencing with the, the virus and even with the political environment and with all of these challenges that are going on and, and within our nation right now, it's hard to see what the end is going to look like and how we're going to be able to get on the other side of that. And so a lot of people are just feeling down. A, a lot of people are really feeling discouraged at the moment. And, and here's what I know to be true about God and that we learn in the Bible about us. And that is that God doesn't want us to live in a constant state of discouragement. That God doesn't want us to lack hope. That God, He wants us to move beyond these feelings and this emotion of discouragement that so many of us are wrestling with right now. So let me tell you where we're headed here. I want us to look at Elijah in the Old Testament because he went through a season, he went through a time of very significant discouragement. And, and I want us to see, you know, what was at the root of some of those feelings of discouragement that he had because they will help us to understand what might be contributing to our feelings of discouragement. I want us to look at how God helped him to move beyond that and then talk about some of the lessons we can learn that might help us to move beyond that as well. So uh, we're going to look today mainly at 1 Kings chapter 19 in the Bible. But before we read that scripture, let me just kind of set this up for you. So the story of Elijah in the Bible is found back in the Old Testament. It was found, it, it, it took place during a time when the nation of Israel had really turned their back on God. They were not doing the things that God wanted them to do. I mean, God wanted to make sure they didn't get caught back up in worshiping idols and false gods. They were doing that. He told them he didn't want them to intermarry with people from other nations because he knew that would pull them away from God. Uh, they were doing that. There were times when, you know, the Bible says they were doing what was evil in the Lord's eyes. I mean, that's a pretty strong statement, wasn't it? You know, ab about their actions and about what they were doing. So they were in one of those times. And beyond that, many of the kings, of Israel, they were particularly evil leaders, people that were far away from God. Well, there was this king, his name was Ahab, and uh, Ahab was a particularly bad person, bad leader. Uh, he was married to a woman by the name of Jezebel. Well, Elijah was the prophet of God during the time of King Ahab and Jezebel. Now, in those days, the prophet of God what their role was is they were there to speak on behalf of God. They were there to, to, to point out the error of people's ways. They were there to confront people about their sinfulness. And that is exactly what Elijah did with King Ahab. 
he went to King Ahab and said, listen, God is displeased with what you're doing. The people of Israel, they're disobedient to God. God is tired of it. You guys need to get your act together. So here's the deal, King Ahab. What's going to happen to Israel is that there's going to be no dew. There's going to be no rain. It's going to be dry for a, a period of time, for years. In fact, it's going to be dry. It's never going to rain again. There's going to be no dew in the ground until I, Elijah, give word that it's okay for this to take place again. Well, you can imagine that this was problematic for King Ahab. In fact, what we know is that God withheld the dew. God withheld the rain. And this went on for three years, so much so that you know, Ahab wanted to kill Elijah. He wanted to kill him. He tried to track him down. So he, Elijah went into a, a period of hiding so that Ahab would not be able to find him. Well, after three years goes by, no rain, Elijah realizes it's time for us to take the next step here. So he sets up a meeting with King Ahab. And he throws out a challenge to him. Here's what he says. He says, Ahab, here's the deal. We're going to meet over at Mount Carmel. And I want you to bring all your false prophets. You know, the prophets of Baal, 450 of them. Prophets of Asherah, you know, they're Jezebel's favorite prophets. You know, you, you go ahead and bring them to 400 of them. You bring all 950 or 850, rather, of those prophets over to Mount Carmel. And here's the challenge. When we, when we do this, I want you to bring two bulls, and we're going to offer sacrifices. And on one sacrifice, you can sacrifice your bull, your God, your, your, you know, your, your prophets, they can call on their gods to come and burn up the sacrifice. I will set up a sacrifice and put the other bull there. And I will call on the one and true and only God to call down fire on that sacrifice. And whichever one of the gods brings down fire on the sacrifice, that will be the one true God. How does that sound, King Ahab? Sounds like a deal to me. So they meet on Mount Carmel. All the people of Israel, they're invited to join them in this. And uh, they get there. Elijah says to the other prophets, go ahead, guys, you go first go first. We'll wait. We'll wait and see what happens. So it goes for hours. I mean, they're chanting. They're crying out. They're cutting themselves. They're doing all kinds of stuff to try to get their gods to send fire out of the heavens to, you know, to, to burn up the sacrifice. Never happens. Never happens. So Elijah says, it's my turn. And he cries out to God, and God just sends fire fire down, and he consumes the sacrifice, and he proved to everybody there that his God, the God of Israel, was the one and only true God. In fact, it tells us when it happened that the people of Israel, that they bowed down and they worshiped God. When that happened, Elijah gave the order. All those false prophets, they all need to be killed, and they were, all 850 of them. And then the Bible tells us that Elijah offered up a prayer to God. And the prayer was, oh God, send rain. Send rain. It's time for you to send rain and prove to these people that you are God. Well, it's interesting because as he started that prayer, as he prayed that prayer, um, some clouds started to form. And I want us to pick up the story in 1 Kings chapter 18 because it's what happens next that is particularly relevant to this discussion of discouragement that I want us to see today. Look with me to what it says. As soon as the sky was black with clouds, a heavy wind brought a terrific rainstorm, and Ahab left quickly for Jezreel. And then the Lord gave special strength to Elijah. He tucked his cloak into his belt, and he ran ahead of Ahab's chariot, King Ahab's chariot, all the way to the entrance of Jezreel. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just like you killed them. Elijah was afraid and he fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. And then he went on alone to the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. And then he lay down, and he slept under the broom tree. 
But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, you need to get up and eat. He looked around, there was beside his head some bread baked on hot stones in a jar of water. So he ate and he drank and then he lay down again. And then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, you need to get up and eat some more or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up, he ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty. But the people of Israel, they have broken their covenant with you. They've torn down your altars. They've killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left and now they're trying to kill me too. Go out, stand before me on the mountain, the Lord said to him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. And then after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak, and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. And then the Lord told him, I want you to go back the same way you came. I want you to travel to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive there, I want you to anoint Haziel to be the king of Aram. And then I want you to anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimsha, to be the king of Israel. And I want you to anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel Mahala, to replace you as my servant. Now, at first glance... Doesn't it seem like an unlikely turn of events in the life of someone who had experienced all that Elijah had experienced? I mean, here he is. He's coming off this great and amazing event, and then he crashes and he burns. He, he gets so discouraged that he, he's ready just to give up. He's ready just to throw in the towel. He is consumed with self-pity. He's very discouraged. There are some lessons that we can learn from what contributed to all that with Elijah that are relevant to us and how we might feel if we're feeling discouraged today. And there are some lessons for us about how God helped him to get out of that discouragement and from some other scriptures in the Bible as well that I think can help us to move beyond our discouragement today. Let's talk about this for a few minutes. A few things that I, I just want to remind you about today that we learn here. Here's the first one. It is possible, first truth, it is possible for anyone to experience periods of discouragement in their lives. You know, I was thinking about this whole story of Elijah. I was thinking about other people in the Bible. You know, here was a guy that had seemingly, from our perspective, everything going for him. I mean, he had experienced God's faithfulness throughout his life over and over. He, he had been uh, witness to some of the greatest miracles. In fact, if you study Elijah's life, there was a time when this, this child died, and ultimately he laid over the top of this child, and this child came back to life. I mean, he was a part of that. It, God had done amazing things in him and through him. He had, he had just watched this great miracle on Mount Carmel, I mean, where God sends fire out of the heavens. I mean, incredible stuff. And yet, next day, Within 24 hours of all this that he experienced, he is so discouraged that he just wants to die. Some people might look at this and say, I mean, it seems like he's, he's entering into a, a time of de depression in his life. Here's what I want you to think about with me for a minute. If this could happen to Elijah, with all that he experienced, with all that he had and 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 the specialness and uniqueness in his relationship with God. If this could happen to Elijah, it can happen to anyone, including you. 
including any of us who love God and, and, and want to do our best to respond to God in the, in the midst of the circumstances we find ourselves with, it can happen to any of us. You know, when you study the Bible, Elijah, he wasn't the only person that ever felt times of discouragement. In fact, I, I want to be careful not to overreach here. I, I think that Jesus at times was discouraged. Uh, one of those times was, you know, right before he was uh, betrayed, he had his disciples, they were all praying together, say, you guys stay here and pray, and Jesus goes away to pray, and when he comes back, he finds them sleeping, not once, but a couple times. I think, you know, in the midst of him understanding that he was about to be, you know, crucified, he was about to be betrayed, he was about to, to experience all of this, he just wanted some people to, you know, to, to be there for him, and he finds him sleeping. That had to be a time of some discouragement in his life. Discouragement can happen to all of us, all of us, regardless of who we are. There can be times, it can be short, there can be seasons of times that any of us can experience some discouragement. But here's what we must never forget. God doesn't want us to remain discouraged. He doesn't want us just to get stuck in our discouragement. He wants us to move beyond it. So how do we do that? Well, Here's the second thing that I, I want you to see with me today. And that is that if we're feeling some discouragement, we need to spend some time thinking about why we are feeling discouraged. And here's the reason why we need to think about this. We need to think about the why because based on what is at the root of our discouragement, it will help us to figure out what we need to do to move beyond it, what we need to address in our life. It's interesting to me that when you study out the life of Elijah and what contributed to this discouragement that he was going through, that there were a number of things. Let me just mention a few of them real quick to you. One of them is that he allowed fear to control his life. I mean, you remember that verse in there where it said, you know, Jezebel threatened him, I'm going to come get you. Uh, you know, if by tomorrow within 24 hours you're not dead, you know, this is a bad thing, I'm after you. It says that Elijah was afraid for his life. And so he fled. He fled. It's interesting how fear and worry and anxiety, and we talked about this the other week, when those things are messing with us, when we allow them to get a grip on our life, life and when we don't deal with them appropriately, it has a way of you know, leading us down a path toward discouragement. Here's the second thing. Elijah, he was physically exhausted. I mean, he had to have been. I mean, you know, God gave him this special strength. He ran ahead of King Ahab's chariot. But, I mean, this was no small run. And, and what we know is that, you know, even after he experienced all of these things and, and then, uh, you know, he, he, he headed back out uh, away from the area to flee away from uh, Jezebel. You know, we know that the angel, when he appeared to them, the angel said, you know, you need something to eat here. You need to get some rest here. Evidently, he, had, he, he was experiencing a, a, a significant time of physical exhaustion. When you and I are physically exhausted, it impacts us spiritually. It impacts us emotionally. When we're not caring for our body, when we're skipping meals, when we're cheating on our sleep, when we're not spending any time doing our Sabbath as God you know, suggested to us that we need in our life, that is a formula for discouragement, and it was a key factor, I am convinced, and why Elijah allowed his emotions to get out of control and why he became so discouraged. Here's the third thing. Elijah lost his perspective about God. You know, if you think about it, he lost his whole perspective about the greatness of God and about the promises of God's protection for him. I mean, he had experienced this over and over throughout his life. You know, he had just watched God do this incredible thing in Mount Carmel, and it was as though he forgot all of that. He forgot all of God's power, all of God's manifestation, all of God's provision for him when he got threatened by a wicked, evil woman. He forgot all of that, seemingly. Somehow along the way, he lost all of his perspective about what he knew to be true about God and all he could think about was his own circumstance. And God got crowded out. He lost his whole perspective about God. 
Boy, you and I at times, that's true of us. In our head, we can know God is real. In our head, we can know God says, I love you, and nothing can ever change that. In our head, we can know God's promise says, I will get you through whatever you face in life. But there are times when in the midst of the circumstances that somehow all that gets shoved aside, all of that gets crowded out, and we lose our perspective about God. And when that happens, it usually fuels feelings of discouragement. Here's the fourth thing. Elijah allowed himself to be consumed with self-pity. You remember when we were reading there, he said things like, Okay, God, I've had enough. He said, I'm no better than any of my ancestors. He said, I'm the only one left. That wasn't true. There were thousands of other people that were still faithful to God that had never worshipped idols. I mean, we can see that when you read the Scripture there. Um, They were trying, now they're just trying to kill me. Self-pity fuels discouragement. Self-pity fuels discouragement. So when you sit around and when you allow yourself just to get consumed with self-pity, you know, I'm the only one going through this, woe is me, I don't know what I'm ever going to do about that, boy, that just fuels and feeds feelings of discouragement in our life. I want to add two other things. Beyond those things that I meant, those four things that kind of fueled Elijah's discouragement, let me tell you two other things that the Bible talks about that adds to people's discouragement that you and I need to think through, especially in light of what we're dealing with right now in our country. Here's the fifth one. We, at times, lose our perspective about difficult circumstances in life. I would just tell you one of my observations as a pastor. I think sometimes, we who are Christians, we think that God owes it to us not to let us go through hard times. At least we act that way toward Him. When bad things happen, it's like, can you believe that happened to me? Can you believe that God, after all I've done for God, after all I'm trying to do right, would let this thing, whatever this thing is, this circumstance, invade into my world? I mean, what's up with this? It is, though, it is as though we have this idea that somehow God promises us a life free of any kind of trouble, a life free of any kind of difficult circumstance, and God never promises that. In fact, I'm just struck, and I don't want to be a downer here. I just want us to be realistic. In fact, I need to, you know, I was reminding myself of these truths. You know, and, and 1 Peter, for example, in the Bible, here's what it says. I mean, to the early church, they were, you know, they were trying to do everything right. And so here's what Peter said to them. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials that you're going through, as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in His suffering, so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing His glory when it is revealed to all the world. Isn't that interesting? Don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're experiencing. I mean, they're just normal when you're a Christian. In John chapter 16, verse 33, I mean, Jesus had just Talk to the disciples. He's about to be betrayed and end up on the cross. And he's telling them, listen, I know it's going to be bad, but really it's going to be all right. The Holy Spirit, he's going to come and he's going to indwell within you. And he gets to the end of this whole discussion about the Holy Spirit and all that's going to happen and how he's going to prepare a place for them. And then he says these words to them. He says, I've told you all of this so that you can have peace. Just remember, here on this earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart, because I have overcome the world. Jesus, of all people, saying to the disciples, I know you've been faithful. I know you've healed people with me. I know you've done, watched me raise Lazarus. You've watched me do amazing things. I'm just telling you guys, you need to be realistic about what lies ahead here. Times are going to be tough. And even when you're faithful to me, there's going to be trials and sorrows and difficulties. But, but hang in there. Don't let them discourage you. I have overcome the world. I don't know how many of you have been following along with the Bible reading plan that we've been doing as a church, you know, and uh, I know hundreds of you are. And uh, here a week or so ago, it struck me, we were reading Matthew chapter 24. And uh, it was, it's the scripture where Jesus is telling people about the end of the age. You know, what's going to happen? What are the signs that are going to take place right before Jesus comes again to this earth? And I tell you, I was reading through those things And they just struck me. I mean, for example, this is what Jesus said, that you and I, 
If, if, you know, I don't know how close we are to Jesus returning again. If he came tomorrow, wouldn't it be a great day? Huh? But uh, we don't know. But, but here's what he said his followers should expect. It says, nation will go to war against nation. I mean, there'll be wars. Kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines. There will be earthquakes and many parts of the world. But all this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Then you, think of this, then you, Christians, you will be arrested persecuted, and even killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and will hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere. And the love of many will grow cold. I tell you, I read that. I thought, wow, sounds like a pretty good description of our day, doesn't it? Now, here's my point. I'm not trying to be this great downer to you about, you know, all this bad stuff that's going to happen to us. My point is this. Sometimes what fuels our discouragement is we think God owes us a life without problems. Some people are misguided enough to think God promises us a life without problems. And so when problems come, we get disillusioned. We get discouraged. And God never promised any such thing. He tells us, you're going to have fiery trials. You're going to have problems. You're going to have really ugly stuff happen closer to the time of my return. Don't be caught up. Don't lose your perspective about that stuff. And one more other thing. Sometimes what contributes to us getting discouraged is that we are caught up in a sinful behavior and we have an unrepentant heart. I really am not going to talk about this very much. I, I just challenge you to read Psalm 38. Here's what's true. We all sin. As long as your heart's soft to God and you confess that sin and you, know, you actually care that you're sinning, that's still pretty healthy. The moment you look at God and say, I don't care what God thinks. I have no remorse about my actions. None. I'm going to do whatever I want. That's going to mess with you. It's going to mess with you spiritually. It's going to mess with you emotionally. It's even going to mess with you physically. Read Psalm 38. David talks about how it just crushed his life, messed with him emotionally. Sin has a way of messing with us big time when our heart is unrepentant. Friends, listen. My point in all of this is that you and I need to take some time and we need to think about so what might be contributing to why I feel discouraged right now? Is it any of those things? Because if it is, you need to do something about them. In fact, it brings me to this last point that I want us to make and so we kind of start wrapping this up. And that is that it is important for you and me to push ourselves to move beyond our discouragement and not to just give up when we feel discouraged. I mean, that's the other big lesson we learn here from Elijah. You know, sometimes people feel discouraged and they enter even into a time of depression and they get immobilized. They do what Elijah did, frankly. They run away, they hide out from people, and they allow themselves just to continue down this spiral of discouragement and depression. But isn't it interesting that God did not let Elijah live in that? That God didn't just say, if that's what you want, Elijah, go ahead. No, what we know is that, that God, he sent an angel and that angel began to minister to him and care for him. That angel pushed him. That angel wasn't about to let Elijah just sit around in self-pity and live in his discouragement. He told him to get up, told him to eat. He provided care for him. He forced Elijah. And then God brought other people into the mix that forced Elijah to get beyond his discouragement. That's what God wants for you and me. He wants us to push through it. I, I don't know how you might be feeling today. I know the feelings that I have in my life. God is saying, do not get stuck in this. Do not live in this. You've got to move beyond your discouragement because I still have something special for you to do and you still have a purpose on this earth and I need you at your best. So what are the keys to that? Well, 
let's just talk about this for a couple minutes, and let me just get real practical here with you as we wrap this up today. So what can we do? A few practical suggestions. First of all, make sure that you're caring for yourself physically. Make sure you're caring for yourself physically. Make sure you're getting enough rest. We saw that with Elijah. That was one of the contributing factors. I, I tell you, in my own life, I'm not very good at this. You know, and I, you know, the whole Sabbath thing and making sure we take a day where we just kind of allow ourselves to chill out a little bit. I'm not good at that. But here's what I know to be true. Whenever I'm not caring for myself, my emotions get all out of whack. And yours do too. It does. Over time. When you're not caring for your body, because God wired you up. You're, you're not just a physical being here. You're a physical being, a spiritual being, an emotional being, and all of that stuff is wrapped up together. And when any of those things get out of whack, it starts to mess with the other thing. So I just ask you the question today. How are you doing physically? You know, are you eating decently? Are you getting enough rest? Have you been trying to burn the candle both ends for a while? In fact, this is what I'd even say to you. You know, you might be feeling okay today, but if you're in an extreme period of time where you're not caring for yourself, you better watch out because you're probably about ready to start down a little bit of a spiral because that's just the way this works. So first suggestion to you is, you know, take care of yourself. You know, and, and I would just say, if chronically you feel exhausted all the time, go to your doctor. Tell them how you're feeling. A express to them that, it, you know, you just feel discouraged and you're down and you, you don't have an appetite. You're not sleeping very well. Allow them to make sure that there's not something else going on that's contributing to all of that. Second thing, I want to encourage you to make sure that you're feeding your minds with things that remind you of God's faithfulness and God's promises. This is lost on us a little bit. But, but I, I just want to point something out to you. God told Elijah, basically, to go to Mount, um, Mount Sinai. You know what Mount Sinai was? It was the place where Moses got the Ten Commandments. It was the place where Moses met with God. It was 40 days away from where Jezebel was. That's probably one of the good things about this, you know. But here's, here's what I, I want you to see with me. I think that one of the things that God wanted was Elijah, you're caught up in the midst of all this junk. You're listening to the threats. Let's get away from those things. Let's, let's get away from the unhealthy stuff in your life. Let's get to where you can meet with me. Let's get to where I can remind you of my promises to you again. And they're good promises, Elijah. For you and me, we need to make sure that in the midst of life, in the midst of church online, not going to church on Sundays where we're all together for a lot of us, where we got all these demands. It is so easy for us to kind of get distracted from God. We must be on guard about that. As your relationship with God goes, so goes everything else. And I will tell you that one of the keys to getting some hope back, one of the keys to getting out of the funk that you're in and moving toward being hope-filled instead of discouraged is to make sure that you're filling your mind with the gangs of God and the promises of God and let God minister in your life. Make sure you're reading the Bible. Make sure that you're praying. Make sure that you're reading some good books. Make sure that you're listening to some good, inspiring Christian music. You know, Right now on our website, we have a link to Right Now Media. It's something that's available to everybody. Go check that out because you can listen to other pastors and people that will feed your mind along with what you're hearing here uh, online or you know when we're out at the park together. But you have to keep feeding your mind with promises and things of God if you're going to move beyond discouragement. Here's the third thing. We need to make sure we surround ourselves with other people who can help lighten our load. You know, Elijah, he got depressed. And when you read all about this, at the end, Eli God said to Elijah, Elijah, I want you to go and I want you to anoint Elisha. And Elisha is going to take over for you as a prophet of God. But, but even more than this, this is what we know about Elijah. Elijah came alongside and he helped Elijah. He helped lighten the load. He helped lighten uh, the, this, this overwhelming sense of responsibility he felt. Elijah felt 
You and I need other people in our life. Here's what we're prone to do when we're discouraged. We're prone to do what Elijah did, and we go hide out from others. And we just think, woe is me, nobody cares about me, nobody's around in my life. That is a disaster. In fact, one of the things that I'm extremely concerned about in our current environment is that we've lost our ability to meet together with other people. And some people are just fearful about being with other people beyond family. God created us with a need for relationship beyond just family. That's a key part, but beyond that. And so somehow we got to figure this out. If you're discouraged today, I challenge you, talk to some other people. Hang out with some other people. I know we're not supposed to hang out with them, but I tell you, you got to find a way to do that or you're going to get discouraged because you are wired up with a need for others. Here's the fourth thing. We need to make sure we trust God to provide everything we need to face whatever happens in our lives. You know, as I I was reflecting on my own life and some of my feelings of discouragement right now, I mean, some of them are church-related, some of them are things in my personal life with my extended family, and, you know, I, you know, I, I really had to fight some discouragement. And for me, this is what I've had to struggle with. It's hard to see the end game. It's hard to see how we're gonna, what's on the other side of this, how we're ever going to get out of some of these challenges that, that we're going through right now. The Apostle Paul, I think he struggled with this some. And uh, he had what we call a thorn in the flesh. It's interesting what, what Jesus said to him. In fact, I want you to look at the Scripture with me because it's relevant here. It says, three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. And each time Jesus said, these were Jesus' words, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in insults and hardships and persecutions and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You know, each time Paul cried out for help, Jesus said to him, Hey, Paul, my grace is all you need. In other words, I'm going to show up just when you need it. You, you think your thorn in the flesh is weighing you down, that it's awful, that it's a bad thing. I'm just telling you, when you need help because of your thorn in the flesh, you can count on me. When you need help, I will be there to give you strength. In fact, here's the good thing for you, Paul. Because you need help, you cry out to me more. And when you are weak, I'm telling you, because you're trusting in me and you're calling on me and you're depending on me, that is when you will be at your strongest. You know what God always does? If you will let him, he will always show up at just the right moment and give you what you need at just the right time. He always does. He did for Elijah. He did for everybody else that we read about in the Bible. He's done it for you in the past, and he'll do it for you again. So you may be discouraged today because you're trying to figure out, you know, what's going to happen tomorrow, what's going to happen a month from now, what's going to happen a year from now. Who knows? But you don't need to worry about it because whatever you need at that moment, Jesus, when you're a follower of Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within you, is going to show up. And when you are at your weakest, you will really be at your strongest. Here's the fifth thing. You and I need to be open to God's care and leading in our lives in unexpected ways. Do you remember the part where he goes, he's out at Mount Sinai, and God says, I want you to go out and listen to me on the mountain. I I just want to read this scripture because I want you to see something with me, and we're about to wrap this whole, whole thing up here says, go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. So Elijah stood there. The Lord passed by and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, He wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance at the cave. And a voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And God ministered to him. Now listen, here's what I want you to see with me. Elijah was used to God communicating in big ways. Was. He was used to that. But this time, that's not how God chose to speak to him. It was in a gentle whisper. Elijah had to be open to what God was going to say to him and how God was going to say it. And you do too. And I do too. Do you know what? In your times of discouragement, God is probably going to speak to you through 
other people, like a child, a grandchild. He'll probably speak to you maybe through a television show you watch or a radio program that you'll listen to. Or it will be in a gentle whisper. It will be as though you're just sitting and maybe you're praying or maybe you're just thinking and maybe you're alone and this God thought will come into your head and it'll come there because the Holy Spirit helped to put it there. And it's God's way of talking to you. Make sure you're open for God to speak to you in ways that you would not always expect Him to do it at your moment of greatest need. And here's the last thing. We need to choose to believe that God has a unique purpose and plan for our lives. Sometimes we wonder, what's the use? Why am I even here anymore? Do I even really matter? Do I really have any value? Would anybody miss me if I weren't here? Does anybody even care how I'm feeling right now? I get that. I understand why some might feel that way, but I just want to remind you today, if you still have breath, you are loved, you are needed, you are cared about by Almighty God Himself. You really are. Can I just take you back to Elijah? So interesting to me. At the end of all this, Elijah's down. God says to Elijah, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to go anoint some kings, and I want you to go... Get, get the Elisha. Do you know that I think what God was doing there was saying to him, you know, this is what your job is. I'm not done with you yet, Elijah. You feel worthless. You feel unneeded. You feel all worn out. You're feeling old. I'm just telling you, I'm not done with you yet. You go do what I created you to do. And I would say this to you. If you have breath, God's not done with you yet. And you might feel like everything's falling apart around you. Mm -mm. It's an opportunity for you. God needs you. God wants you. God is counting on you. If he didn't, he would have taken you out of this miserable world and taken you to heaven already. But he didn't. Because he's got a plan for your life. You need to believe who God made you to be. You need to believe that truth. And you need to live in that and you need to go out and make a difference for him even in the midst of your discouragement. And when you get your eyes off your circumstances and you and get them on God and others and what he's called you to do, it will pull you out of your discouragement and help you to move beyond it. We need to end. If you're feeling discouraged today, I get it. I I really do. I understand it. But don't let your circumstances control your life. Choose to see your circumstances and choose to see your life the way that God sees them. And I would just remind you, what is happening in your world and your life is not bigger than God's ability to help you through it. And God has a plan for you. He really does. And it's a good plan for your life. And when you are a child of God, and when you have a relationship with Jesus, there is always hope. Can I just be this blunt? There's really no need to be discouraged. Hold on to God. Believe what God says about you. And go live for Him. And if you will, some of those feelings of discouragement, they'll start to go by the wayside. And there'll be newfound hope in your life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful today for your love for us. I'm thankful today for your care for us. Lord, I know in my own life, I know how I feel. I know that I'm not alone, that there's a lot of people really struggling with some discouragement right now. And God, I pray for them. I just pray for your anointing. I pray for your blessing on their life. I pray that you would surround them with people that can help them, just like, God, you surrounded Elijah. I pray that you would remind every one of us that we are needed and valued and loved by you and that you've got a plan for our life, a purpose for our life. So help us to go live out that purpose. Help us to trust you every step of the way. And God, would you help lighten the load for us. You are amazing, you are faithful, and you are good. And we worship you, 
and we honor you today. May the words of this song that we close with today be an encouragement to our hearts in this week that is ahead. And we pray all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. That the highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. The sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child.
Hey church, Pastor Mark here. As Pastor Mike was sharing that message with us, it took me back to a old family tradition. My grandfather, when he retired from the Navy, moved to a large farm where his brother and sister already lived. Over the times of visiting with them, it became a family tradition. At some point, you took the tractor out and of course you got it stuck in a ditch or in a big pile of mud or something and you would have to walk back to the house with your head down and take all the jokes and ribbing from the family but of course the family would gather around go get another tractor or a truck and go out and pull you out of the ditch so let me ask you today are you stuck in the ditch of discouragement do you just feel stuck and unable to get out if that's where you're at let me encourage you to do two things first of all Take to heart what Pastor Mike taught us today and apply it to your life and trust Christ to help you get through it. And then secondly, take advantage of that idea of letting the church, your family, help you through it. If you need some help, give us a call at the church or send us an email and one of the pastors here would be glad to sit down with you or talk on the phone and help you through this time of discouragement in your life. We love you, church, and we look forward to seeing you soon.